My name is Debbie Nicole. I'm with the Kent County Master Gardeners. Um, this is the first time I've done a workshop on insects. Uh, my husband and I have been fascinated with all the bugs in our garden this year, so we decided to make it into a workshop for you and share everything that we've learned. So we're going to start with some basic definitions. We're talking about two different kinds of creatures here. Um, one of them is predatory creatures. And predatory creatures are ones that actually consume their prey. Um, they either just eat it whole or chew it up and swallow it, or they actually will uh, kill it and, and then just um, eat the juices out of the body rather than consume the entire bug. Um, so as you see here, this lovely close up of the praying mantis uh, eating the, uh, its prey. Um, the other type of creature we're going to talk about um, are parasitoid creatures. Um, and basically what a parasitoid creature is, is something that um, lays its eggs in on, usually it's a, a, some kind of caterpillar, but not always. And those eggs hatch into larva and the larva will eat um, the host until it dies. Um, so that's another way. And in the picture here, you see a tomato hornworm. This is actually from my own garden. Um, I believe it was last year. And I just let these, let this thing stay on my plant until the larva consumed uh, the, the uh, tomato hornworm. So I didn't have to kill it. And that way I'm also, I'm also allowing all these other uh, uh, parasitoid wasps that laid their eggs on here survive and go out and kill your tomato hornworms. So um, in, in letting this hornworm live, I have allowed it to produce more hornworms that uh, produce more uh, wasps that will let your horn, hornworms die at your house. So the first one we're gonna talk about, and this is like one of the best things you can possibly have in your, in your garden. And this is a um, seven spotted ladybug. There are actually 480 kinds of ladybugs in North America. This is just one of them. Um, one of the common ones that you might see is, a, is called a convergent ladybug. It's actually not a native, the convergent isn't. But it looks similar to this one, only it has a little more white around the top. Um, so those are both your, you know, the ones you see all the time with the red with the black spots or the orange with the black spots. Um, there's a few other kinds I wanted to mention. Uh, there's a two-spotted lady ladybug, which only has two spots. Um, it has orange with two black spots. There's another kind that has two spots that's black with orange spots. And this is known as a twice-stabbed ladybug. Um, and the reason I'm really interested in those is they eat armored scales. They're one of the few things that can eat ar armored scales. And I do have armored scales on my, on my maple tree. Um, so I would be very happy to invite these um, insects into my garden. Um, there's another type that's all black. If you see a ladybug that's all black, that's called a spider mite destroyer, and that's what their diet is. Um, and have you ever seen the pink spotted one? We had one of those in our garden the other day. It has a little bit of a different spot pattern, um, but there's a sp pink spotted lady um, beetle, which is actually a native, and, and those are native to the eastern uh, two-thirds of the country in Canada. Um, and what ladybug's favorite food, their very favorite food is aphids. They will eat aphids like crazy. So if you have an aphid problem in your garden, um, the little, little tiny bugs that suck the juices out of your plants, um, these guys will go in and take care of those for you. Um, actually, the first ever example of biologic control um, in crops was way back in 1888 um, when some uh, Ladybugs called Vidalia beetles were actually imported from Australia. They're native to Australia. They imported them into California because they had a problem with um, cottony cushion scale in the citrus groves. Um, so they actually started using bugs to take care of that way back in 1888. Um, so ladybugs are one that will chew their prey up and eat it. Um, but the other thing is the adults will also eat um, pollen, nectar, and honeydew, in addition to the aphids. So the good thing is, if you want to attract these guys to your garden, you can 
plant some of their favorite foods. Um, and I like to grow herbs, so herbs are, are good to grow in your garden. Um, ladybugs can be attracted to cilantro, dill, fennel, oregano, thyme, and yarrow. They like the pollen from those plants. So if you plant those uh, herbs in your garden, you're likely to attract some ladybugs, which will take care of your aphids. Um, next is actually, um, I wanted to show you a picture of this because this is a lady beetle larva. And they actually eat more aphids than the ladybugs do. That's their sole diet. Um, they don't look anything like a ladybug. And a lot of the times you'll see that the larva of these different um, bugs and insects doesn't look anything like the adult version. So if you see these things on your plants, don't kill them. They are excellent eaters of aphids. Um, so how this works is lady beetles will lay five to 30 kind of yellow orangish eggs and they have pointed tips. So they'll look kind of unusual. And they usually lay them near where aphids are. So a lady beetle will lay, these, lay their eggs near where they see the aphids so that when their eggs hatch and their larvae come out, they have instant food there. Um, so the, uh, this is the most important stage of the ladybug's life. Um, and it lasts about three to five weeks and then they pupate and become your, you know, the lady beetles that you know. So these are really fast hunters. They will move really fast over the plants. They're a lot faster than the adults and they will consume a lot of those aphids for you. Okay, the next insect I wanna show you, actually a beetle, is a ground beetle. Um, ground beetles are really good for cleaning up all those insects that are in the, at the ground level. They don't climb much, they mostly stay on the ground um, and they eat a lot, a lot of insects and they'll actually eat snails and slugs also. Um, so sometimes they're black, a lot of times the ones I've seen have been black, but you can also get them in a greenish color or a blue-green color. Um, there are, let's see, there are a lot of different species of these. There's actually one species called the bombardier beetle. That's a type of ground beetle that actually has a um, noxious spray that it sprays from its abdomen that's like boiling temperature and it uses that to shoot at its prey. So that's, a, that's one specialized kind of ground beetle. Um, this is actually the larva of that ground beetle. Um, so these are also good um, predators. They will eat um, things that are at the surface of the soil. Um, they actually make little tunnels and the females lay their eggs in the soil and the larva will grow for one to two years in the soil and then they'll pupate um, and then they'll come out in the spring as beetles that they will eat things like at the soil surface and underground. So if you see anything that looks like this, this is a good bug to have. And I love this one. I've seen these in my garden. If you guys have ever seen these shiny green bugs, um, this particular one is a six spotted tiger beetle. Um, they're really, really active. They do fly. Um, the larvae of the tiger beetle, I don't have a picture of them because they mostly live in little soil tubes under the soil and they actually ambush their prey. So they sit there and wait for something to come by and then they go grab it. Um, there's about 2,000 species of tiger beetles and a hundred of those are in North America. Um, so tiger beetles can be black or they can be gray, brown, or black with white spots, um, or they can be this shiny, shiny green, like the six-spotted tiger beetle. Um, also, they come in violet, orange and black, iridescent blue, and bronze. And the way you can tell these apart from the ground beetles, if you notice this area, the thorax area, is more narrow than its head. Um, with ground beetles, it's not this shape, so. Excuse me. Sorry, that, sorry about that, my husband is on the phone. Um, so uh, these are about half an inch long. They are related to the ground beetles and they only live about six weeks. Um, the really cool about this thing about these is the reason they're called a tiger beetle is they hunt like a tiger. They will actually run um, up to five miles an hour 
which is really fast for a tiny little bug. Um, and that's also equivalent to running 125 body lengths in a second. So these things just really fly across the ground after their prey. They stalk their prey and they will hunt it down like a tiger. Um, they eat ants, um, beetles, caterpillars, flies, grasshopper nymphs, in, all kinds of insects, spiders, and small terrestrial crustaceans, like uh, those little roly polies that you see, they eat those too. Um, they like sand. Um, a lot of their habitat is in sandy beach-like areas, um, and some of this habitat has been um, lost due to problems with um, traffic on beaches and those kinds of things. So um, they, their population uh, is a little bit in danger because of that. But if you have sandy soil in your area, um, you might see some of these guys. Okay, our next friend here is the rove beetle. Um, so these are long, longer beetles. They have really short wings. There's actually more than 63,000 species of rove beetles. Um, and they eat insects and mites in the soil, but some of them are also scavengers. So they will also eat dead animals, um, dung, fungi, those kinds of things. Um, the larvae of these beetles will eat maggots and cutworm and armyworm larvae. Um, they actually have um, sold, these are, have actually been sold to greenhouses because they will help um, do a biological control of fungus gnat larvae in greenhouses, which can be a problem. So you can buy rove beetles, rove beetle larvae to take care of that. Um, so they come, there's all, they also come in all different colors, um, but the reason, way you can recognize them is basically by this long shape and short wings. Okay, and talk a minute about the soldier beetle. Um, these are also called leather winged beetles. Um, this particular one is a red and black one. Um, the adults mostly eat pollen. Uh, they like flowers, they like yellow flowers like goldenrod or rabbit bush. Um, and these little guys are about a half inch to three quarters of an inch long and they can be yellow or orange with black. Um, some, of the, some of the species will eat insects as adults, um, but some of them only eat pollen as adults and their larvae are what control the um, insects. Uh, the larvae eat um, the insects in the soil, aphids, mealybugs, mites, caterpillars, grubs, fly maggots, snails, and slugs. And also sometimes they have, these have been known to come into your house. But if they do come into your house, I would just put them outside because they are not a bad bug and they can be a lot more helpful in your garden than they can in your house. Um, I wanted to show you this picture. Actually, this is another type of soldier beetle. Um, these are native to our, our part of the world, Delaware and Maryland. So you might see more of these yellowish colored ones. Um, they're known as the goldenrod soldier beetle, um, also the Pennsylvania leatherwing. Um, so they have the same habits. I just wanted to show you a picture because this is the way you might see them at your house in your garden. Um, I actually took this picture myself. This is um, on a, my elderberry when it was blooming. So they were e eating the pollen. Uh, the next beetle that we're going to talk about is actually what we call a firefly or a lightning bug, which is technically a beetle. Um, so uh, they're, you know, they're different. They have, of course, the light organs. Um, the larvae of the fireflies eat um, slugs, snails, earthworms, um, and some of the adults will eat scale crawlers and aphids. Um, these are very, fire, fireflies are very common in the eastern United States. There's not very many of them out west. Um, the adult fireflies will also eat uh, pollen and nectar, they think, but actually, they um, might not eat, they're not even sure that they actually eat at all as adults. And there are some species of lightning bugs that'll actually eat each other. Um, so it's one of those things like the praying mantis where the, the uh, males will track down and eat, I mean the females will track down and eat the males. Okay, um, the next one is called the minute pirate bug. Um, I just wanted to put these in here, although you may never see them because they're only about one sixteenth of an inch long. 
Um, the reason they're in here is just that I wanted to show you that there are bugs in your garden that are doing good that you don't ever see. They're so tiny that you probably don't even notice them. Um, these um, bugs are the smallest of the predatory true bugs. Um, they come in black and white, dark gray or brown, and they actually eat thrips, um, aphids, spider mites, and other insects' eggs. Um, they like to hang out near flowers, so they're attracted to the flowers, and then they feed on the thrips that are eating your flowers, but they also will eat the pollen and nectar. Um, there's a lot of other tiny, tiny bugs that I didn't put in this presentation because I really wanted to emphasize the ones that you're more likely to see in your garden. Um, and the other ones, you just know that they're there. Okay, now we're gonna move up to the bigger bugs. Um, this is, you may have seen these in your garden. I've seen a lot of them. Um, the wheel bug, which is a type of assassin bug. Um, these are, this is actually one of the largest assassin bugs and they are generalist predators. In other words, they will eat anything they can catch, including each other. Um, they can get from one and a quarter to two inches long. Um, they actually grab their prey and they inject it with a toxin that kills it in 30 seconds. Um, so they do bite. So you don't wanna pick one of these up. Um, although they have a bite that is actually said to be more painful than a wasp sting. Um, but the, their bite is not dangerous. They don't actually um, cause an, a reaction where you would have to go get medical attention. Um, they're no, they don't move very fast um, and they actually have piercing mouth parts. I think you can actually see um, at the front of his mouth here that he has this long uh, part here that he uses to uh, stick into his prey and suck the juices out. So these guys um, eat by, by sucking the juices out of their prey. So this one actually, my husband took this picture, which is really, really cool picture. This is actually the nymph of a wheel, bu wheel bug. Um, the wheel bugs go through five stages of molting. Um, he took this picture probably a couple weeks ago and they're still hanging out on my sunflowers. And this one actually at this point has the red color is gone. It's all more of a grayish blackish color at this point. So it goes through several stages of molting. Um, and these guys will live for an entire year. Um, they'll lay their eggs in the fall um, and then they'll, they'll hatch and they'll be around for the, uh, the next year. They eat the same things as the adults. They, uh, uh, they are totally predators. Um, you can also see here, um, even in this picture, the mouth part um, where they will inject toxins and suck the juices out of their prey. And believe it or not, I got a video of this guy catching a bumblebee in my, in my garden the other day, which was kind of sad. They hang out on my sunflowers waiting for the bees to come. But then there's other bugs that are eating my sunflowers. So I'm hoping that while they're out there, they will grab some of these other ones. Um, and the nymphs also, like the adult uh, wheel bugs, do have a very painful bite. So you don't wanna pick them up. Um, I have literally dozens of these at my house this year. Okay, let's talk about stink bugs. Um, did you know that all stink bugs are not bad? Um, this is one of the two that we have um, locally. Uh, this one is the spined uh, soldier bug. Um, you can tell the difference from the other stink bugs by looking at these points here on the, on the shoulders. The bad stink bugs, like the marmina marminated brown stink bug, will have more curved, rounded shoulders. Um, this one with the points is a good stink bug. Um, you can also identify them by their mouth parts. So if you look at the mouth part here, um, the good stink bugs, the predatory stink bugs, have a shorter, thicker um, mouth part. The bad ones have a longer, thinner one. Um, if you don't want to get close enough to the stink bug to closely examine its mouth parts, which I understand, um, just observe what it's on. If you see a stink bug and it's sitting on a leaf and it's not, doesn't appear to be having done any damage or eat, eating anything, it might be a good stink bug. If you, see a, if you see a stink bug on your, you know, berries, which they're terrible with my berries, um, 
then it's probably, and you see lots of holes and damage to your plants, then it's probably a bad stink bug. So that's probably the easiest way to tell them apart. Um, the other stink bug that you'll see around here that's good is called a two-spotted stink bug. I don't think I've ever seen one, but they have a really, they're really colorful. They have a really interesting um, pattern on their back that looks like a keyhole. I don't have a picture of one um, handy, um, but they have, they can be red and black or yellow and black or orange and black or even green and black. So they have black with a, a pattern on them and they are also a good stink bug. Um, so these good stink bugs will attack um, insects even larger than themselves and suck out the body fluids. Um, and they eat grubs, larvae of beetles and moss, and caterpillars. Um, the good thing about the two-spotted stink bugs, um, they eat the eggs and the larvae of the Colorado potato beetle. Um, if you're growing eggplant and you get problems with your eggplant and you see these little striped um, bugs on them, those are the Colorado potato beetles and these guys, that's one of their favorite foods. Um, so this is the green lacewing. Um, the adults um, eat mostly insect, but mostly nectar, pollen, and honeydew, and they will eat small insects. Um, if you want to attract green lacewings to your garden, plant um, herbs like angelica, caraway, tansy, yarrow, dill, fennel, cilantro, and those will attract the adult lacewings. So the adult lacewings aren't really that much of a benefit except for their babies. Um, so they actually um, will lay eggs and produce these uh, green lacewing larvae, which look like this. And these are also called aphid lions is their nickname because they eat aphids like crazy. Um, they also eat small caterpillars, beetles, um, mites, mealybugs, spider mites, white flies, scale, and thrips. These guys um, consume by, again, piercing, using piercing mouth parts, um, as you can kind of see in the picture, and sucking the fluids out of their prey. Um, and they can actually do, kill and take care of as much as 60 aphids an hour. Um, so they are, they are great to have in your garden if you have an aphid problem. Um, actually, the eggs of green lacewings have been sold as a biological control for aphids and caterpillars. Um, they also have, this was another interesting thing, they also um, call them trash carrying larvae because they will camouflage themselves by sticking things to themselves. And I had something in my garden that was wiggling around, it looked like it was covered with dead flowers. And I, I suspect that that's what this was. Um, it was moving around and I'm like, what is this? It looks like dead flowers crawling on my plants. Um, but I believe it was probably a green lacewing larva. Okay, now we're getting into the wasp families. Um, this is a cicada killer. Um, I wanted to put this in here since this year the cicadas are supposed to be coming out. So you may see some of these. Um, they are somewhat of a beneficial. They're not as good, not as much of a beneficial as other wasp are. So I wanted to mention to mention these. Um, they are solitary wasps, meaning they don't have they don't live in colonies like paper wasps do. Um, the females do have stingers, so they inject when they find a cicada. They inject it and paralyze it. They don't kill it. What they do with the cicada is they bury it with their um, eggs so that when the eggs hatch, the, the uh, um, cicada killer wasp can, can, uh, larva can consume the cicada that's paralyzed, not dead, it's just stunned. Uh, so that's what they do. Um, they're not aggressive to people at all. Most solitary wasps are not aggressive. Um, the males sometimes will like defend the, um, the females by flying at you and flying around, but the males, inter interesting, enough cannot sting. Only the females can sting, but they usually don't. Um, the problem you can have with cicadas, if you have them in your garden, is they will dig up the soil to, to lay their eggs and they will actually disrupt your garden. They can move as much, uh, they can move several pounds of soil by digging. So um, they can dig up your garden pretty well. 
Um, if you do have a problem with these digging in your garden, you can just pour some water into those holes and that discourages them and they'll basically go find some, go find a better spot. Um, the adults will eat nectar and tree sap. Um, so they're not really, they don't really eat a lot of uh, other things in your garden. So the larvae will only eat the cicadas. So cicadas, I don't know if you think they're a problem or not. Some cicada larvae will eat roots of plants. Um, so that could be a problem, but cicadas in general are known for the, the singing. Um, so if you enjoy the singing, you might not want to encourage these cicada killers to come. Um, the next kind of wasp, I wanted to put this one here because we actually have these in our garden and they're really cool looking because they have this really skinny little body part. Um, this is a paper uh, potter wasp. Um, and potter wasp are other solitary wasps. Um, but they don't, they're related to paper wasps, but they actually build mud nests. So if you see little things that look like little clay pots in your garden, that might be a potter wasp nest. Um, so they are non-aggressive, they rarely sting, um, and they will eat uh, uh, paralyzed caterpillars and beetle larvae and put those in their nest, that little clay pot, for their um, larvae to eat. Um, the, the adults usually just eat flower nectar. Um, I actually have these all over my mint. My mint has gone, you know, is blooming right now. And these are all over my mint. So they're good because they will take the uh, caterpillars and beetle larvae that might be eating your plants and feed them to their young. Okay, um, paper wasp family. Um, two of the common things that you might see around here, yellow jackets as pictured is a paper wasp and also the bald face hornet. The bald face hornet is actually a paper wasp. Um, the name hornet is misleading because it's not actually a hornet, it is a wasp. Um, so the uh, yellow jackets, the bald face hornets are great because they eat flies like crazy. Um, they will eat deer flies, horse flies, and they take them back to their nest and they feed them to their young. Um, they are a little bit aggressive if you, if you disturb their nest. So this is something you have to think about when I talk about whether or not you wanna invite these into your garden. Um, we had a, a bald-faced hornet build a huge nest um, on our porch. Um, is one of those things where I told my husband, look, there's a nest that's being built, look. Look, it's getting bigger. Look, it's getting bigger. So by the time he did something about it, the thing was huge. Um, but it's like we, you know, even though they're good uh, for killing flies, um, we didn't want to get stung. We didn't want the grandkids to get stung. So those are the things you have to think about when you um, decide whether or not you want to keep these around. Um, so all paper wasps are primarily predators of live insects. Um, and then when they get older, adults, they switch to nectar and honeydew. Um, they feed their young living insects, caterpillars, like and fly, ma fly maggots. Um, and the other thing about yellow jackets is most, as many adults are scavengers and they will come disturb your picnic, trying to get your food instead of going out and get insects. So a lot of people want to discourage uh, yellow jackets because of the um, nuisance that they are when you're trying to eat outdoors. So they are usually actually considered more on the nuisance side than the beneficial side, but they do have benef beneficial properties because they do, um, they are predators. Okay, um, this guy is actually, um, this picture is a little bit misleading. This is a really, really tiny wasp. Um, this is one of the parasitoid wasp. Um, so this is a braconid wasp. There's a lot of different kinds of parasitoid wasp and I just chose this one because I actually had these in my garden. Um, there's about 1900 species of these in North America. A lot of them are all black instead of the red. They don't all have the red. Um, and they are small, less than half an inch. All of them are less than half an inch. These do not sting. They are non-stinging wasps. Um, what they do is being parasitoids, they lay their eggs um, on or inside their host. And then the eggs hatch and the larvae come out and they feed on, on the host. Um, so the, uh, the wasp larvae, they will eat your tomato hornworms. 
Um, they will eat bag worms, they will eat cabbage worms, and very important to me, they will eat Japanese beetles. Um, they will actually uh, parasitoid Japanese beetles, which I don't know if you have a problem with Japanese beetles, but they are crazy around here. Um, and they will also uh, prey on squash vine borers. Um, the adults will eat nectar, pollen, honeydew, and some will also, some species will also eat insects. Um, you can attract these wasps to the garden by planting again, um, if you like herbs, dill, fennel, lemon balm, thyme, yarrow, cilantro, and they're also attracted to small blossoms like carrot and cabbage blossoms. Now this is actually the important part. This is what they do. Um, this picture is actually a tobacco hornworm. Um, the one I had earlier was my tomato hornworm, but this picture is really good and clear, so I wanted to use it. Um, so these are, these are actually braconid wasp co co cocoons on this. Um, so the female lays the eggs inside the caterpillar's body. Um, and then the wasp larvae develop and they feed inside the caterpillar. So when they're ready to pupate, they actually come out, they chew their way out and they spin these little cocoons here. And then when they're ready to come out of their cocoons, um, they will just make a hole and emerge from these cocoons that are on the outside of the wasp. Um, so how they kill it, they actually have a virus. So they, when, the, when the, um, the wasp lays the eggs, it actually puts a virus along with the eggs into the worm. And the, what the virus does is it actually weakens the worm so that the worm doesn't reject the eggs um, of, the, of the wasp. So it weakens it so that the larva can do their job and consume the, um, the worm. So I thought that was really interesting. I mean, nature is just fascinating how these guys work to do these things. So these are not actually, again, these are not actually the, the larva on the outside, or they are the cocoons. The eggs were laid inside, and when they're ready to pupate, they make the cocoons, and then that's how they get out and their host will die. They eat it till it, till it dies. Okay, um, next is the hoverfly, also known as the cirphid fly. Um, these are tiny little flies. They're about one fourth to one, fourth to one and a fourth inches. Um, they look, they mimic bees. You might see what their, their pattern. You can tell them apart because they have two um, wings instead of four. Um, they can be yellow, orange, and black, and they feed on nectar. Um, the adults, they're called hoverflies because the adults can be seen hovering over the flies, um, and they will actually uh, be attracted over the flowers. They're actually attracted to uh, nectar from dill, fennel, feverfew, lavender, mint, yarrow, cilantro, and the flower alyssum they're attracted to. Um, and sometimes they actually land on people and drink their sweat. So we always call them sweat bees, um, but they actually don't sting. Um, and the larvae are insect predators of aphids. And this next slide is a picture of a hover hover tail, hoverfly larva. Um, as you can see, this picture is enlarged a lot because it's eating aphids and you know, aphids are tiny, tiny things. So you can see a perspective of how tiny these hoverfly larvae are. Um, so basically they're totally predators. They crawl all over the plants. They eat aphids, cabbage worms, caterpillars, um, mealybugs. And these guys are really important late and early in the season when the other predators aren't out yet. So if you see these out, they can early in the spring and later in the fall, um, that's when they can do the most good because they're, the other ones are, are not, not around then. Um, they're not very easy to see because they're really small and they don't move very fast and they're also pretty camouflage. Okay, um, this, is, this is a fly that's a parasitoid. It's a tachinid fly. It, it um, does the same kinds of things as the wasp. It lays its eggs in or on um, its host. Um, they're over uh, 1,500 known species of this fly. 
Um, it looks like a housefly, except for you can tell that it has these bristly hairs. If you look at this close up of the picture, not that you're really going to look at flies that close, I imagine. But if you see all these little hairs, that's how you can tell it's a parasitoid fly rather than just a normal housefly. Um, they are parasitoids of caterpillars, Colorado potato beetles, um, cucumber beetles, Mexican bean beetles, sawfly larvae, earwigs, grasshoppers, and Japanese beetles. They will lay their eggs on Japanese beetles and consume those. Um, so a couple ways they operate. One way they do is they lay their, their eggs near the host's food. Um, like if the host is eating um, one of your plants in your garden, they'll lay their eggs on that plant so that the host will actually eat them by accident, eat the eggs, and the eggs will hatch inside and the maggots will feed on the host. Um, so they, they also do that in addition to actually um, laying their eggs inside or, or on their host. Um, you can attract these tachinid flies by planting cilantro, dill, fennel, parsley, feverfew, chamomile, and buckwheat. And the adults will feed on uh, the nectar from flowers and the honeydew um, that's left by aphids and scales. Okay, on to some more of the bigger bugs. Um, this is a robber fly. Um, these are some of the top aerial predators. So in other words, they capture their prey while it's flying in the air. Um, so they will actually grab the insects with their front legs and they paralyze it with a bite and then they will go consume it. Um, so they are generalist predators of flying insects. Um, and you can see he caught one in this picture. Um, they eat anything that they can catch. Um, their larvae will also eat, are also predators and they will eat uh, soft bodied insects. Um, the, the robber flies can grow to one to two inches long. Um, they also, when they fly, they have a loud buzz. So sometimes you might think that they sound like horse flies, um, but they're actually a, a very good predator of the airways. Now we get to one of my very favorites, um, which is the dragonfly. Um, they are also aerial hunters. Um, they hunt during the day. Um, both their larvae and their adults are predators, although their larvae live in, in, in or near water. Um, so you, if you're not in or near water, you might not see the, the larvae. Um, most of them eat smaller um, prey, such as mosquitoes, small flies, midges, gnats, leafhoppers, and beetles. But some of the bigger dragonfly species will also kill large flies, butterflies, bees, and each other, other dragonflies. Um, so they are large, generally like from one to three and a half inches. Um, often they are very colorful. Um, you see them in lots and lots of different colors flying around, but they're easy to recognize um, dragonflies because of the way that they, they fly. They dart and hover. They are found a lot around ponds. Um, they have very large eyes that take up most of their head. And they have two pairs of wings. Um, and the thing you can tell about dragonflies is they hold their, their wings out horizontally when they're perching, when they're at rest. Um, so they catch and eat their, their prey in flight. And they eat, um, well, like I said, the other, I already mentioned what they eat. Um, and the, the nymphs that live in the water, they eat a lot of aquatic insects that are in the water. And the relative of the, of the dragonfly is the damselfly. Um, damselflies are very similar to dragonflies. They're usually smaller and they have a little bit smaller eyes. And very often they are very colorful, very brightly colored with these metallic covers, colors. Um, they can have wings that are spread out, but usually they keep their wings um, up when they're perched up behind them, like you see in the picture, instead of spread out like a dragonfly. That's an easy way to tell them apart from a dragonfly. Um, they're usually about one to two inches. 
Um, they're a little bit more fragile and delicate looking than the dragonflies. Um, they also eat mosquitoes, midges, and other flies. And they also lay their eggs in the water. And the nymphs, just like the, the um, dragonflies, the nymphs will eat the aquatic insects. Okay, this is another one of my own pictures. Um, this is, has a lot of different names. Um, it's a, uh, we called it a garden spider. It's also called a golden orb weaver. Um, so these, these guys can have bodies that are an inch long. Um, they build very large, very strong webs that can hold uh, animals or insects as large as grasshoppers and other large prey. And the unique thing about them, as you can see in this picture, the center of their web, they have this um, reflective silk and they make a zigzag pattern out of that. I'm not really sure why they, why they do that. Um, so these guys can be called uh, black and yellow ar argiopes, uh, black and yellow garden spiders, corn spiders, golden garden spiders, golden orb weavers, a riding spider, um, yellow garden argiope, and a yellow garden orb weaver, and a zipper spider, because also you notice that this kind of looks like a zipper. Um, so that's where they get that name. Um, the, the females are about an inch in their body, the males are smaller. They find their prey by sensing the vibrations in the web. So they just sit there at their web and when they feel the vibration, they go after their prey and they are generalists. They will eat anything that gets stuck in their web. Um, they're not aggressive to humans. Um, if you aggravated it enough or try to pick it up and hold it and mess with it, it could bite you, but the bite is not um, harmful to humans. They are also definitely considered to be beneficial. Um, there's another type of orb weaver called a barn orb weaver, if you've heard of that, um, which is actually what uh, Charlotte, in the book Charlotte's Web was, she was a barn orb weaver. And uh, the interesting thing is the name that um, Charlotte had in Charlotte's Web, if you remember, is uh, Charlotte A. Cavatica, which is interesting because the Latin name for the barn orb orb weaver is a cavaticus. So there's a little spider trivia for you. Um, another spider is the wolf spider. Um, there's over 240 different species. They're not all um, this color. They can be gray, brown, or almost black. And some of them have stripes, but not all of them. Um, they can range in size from one quarter of an inch to an inch and a half. And some of the larger spiders um, are often mistaken for a brown recluse or a, even a tarantula, um, but they're not, they're pretty um, har harmless. Uh, they hunt on the ground and they dig, barrow, dig actually dig burrows in the ground and they line those with their silk. They don't spin webs, they just put their silk in their burrows and they actually ambush their prey from these burrows. Um, they are afraid of people, so they will run away from you and not try to bite you. If you do um, aggravate it, of course, like anything, it will react and bite. Um, they will eat large insects and they will also eat other spiders. Okay, this is a jumping spider. This is a very close up picture because these things are actually pretty tiny. Um, they can be about a tenth of an inch to a fourth of an inch in size. Um, there's over 300 species in the U.S. and they're very common. You don't see them a lot because they're so small, so you probably just don't notice them. Um, they ha actually have um, eight eyes in a single row. If you look closely at the picture, you can see their eight eyes. Uh, the two in the middle are the, the big ones that are facing straight forward. In addition, they have on each side three other eyes. Um, so they have the very, very good eyesight, which they use to um, stalk their prey. Um, they have the best eye eyesight of all the spiders, actually. Um, the reason they're called jumping spiders is because they can jump 10 times their body length. Well, 
you know, if they're a tenth of an inch long, then they're jumping like an inch. So um, it's 10 times their body length could be just an inch, but they can jump. Um, so that's, that's where they got their name. Um, so the ability to jump and their excellent eyesight are, make them be very active um, predators. Um, they have silk, but they don't spin webs. They use it to just anchor it, um, anchor themselves for a jumping off spot. And they use it to wrap up egg cases. Uh, they eat insects and spiders and they are completely harmless to humans. And I think they're really cute. I'd like to you know, have a little spider stuffed animal that looks like this guy. Um, they can be very colorful also, but not necessarily. They can also be just be black. So although there are many other spiders, um, all spiders are predators. So I'm not going to go into every single spider. These are just some inter more interesting common ones that you might see. Um, of course, you know, there's always the, the, you know, the really dangerous ones like the black widows and everybody I hope knows what a black widow looks like and knows not to pick one up. Um, but black widows in addition are also predators. Um, they will spin webs and catch other insects. Um, so now we're going to talk about another arthropod, which is a centipede. Um, they are predators of other arthropods, both insects and spiders, and they feed on pests on or near the soil surface. Um, some of the species that are found in the U.S. can actually reach up to six inches in length, but most of them are more like an inch long. Um, if you find one that's two inches long or bigger, um, those could bite you if you pick them up. Um, the number of legs they have can vary from 10 to over 100, depending on what the species is. And they actually live a long time. They can live from three to seven years. Um, there is a form of a centipede called a house centipede. Um, so they actually are some that live their whole lives in your house. Um, the important thing about those is actually if they are in your house, their favorite food inside is um, cockroaches and spiders. So um, if you have centipedes and you never see a cockroach, maybe um, you just don't have any. So that's a good thing or um, the centipedes are taking care of those for you. So you don't necessarily want to get rid of them if they're in your basement. Um, so they forage at night and, um, and they are also attracted to lights because they go after the other insects that are attracted to the lights. Um, there's another kind of centipede that's called a soil centipede that are really, really small. They live in the soil and they're, they're completely blind. So they just track their, their food in the soil um, without being able to see it. So there's some different, all different kinds of centipedes which um, are predators, so they are not a bad thing to have in your garden. Okay, now to the big guy. Um, a praying mantis, praying mantids, um, there are three different kinds that could be found in this area. Um, the first kind is a European mantid, um, which can be green or brown. Um, they are kind of camouflaged. So if they grow in an area that's a lot of green, they will turn green. If they grow somewhere where there's a lot of brown, they will turn brown. Um, so they adapt to their environment. Um, and they're found more in the north. So you may or may not see them around here. Um, another one that's native to here is actually the Carolina mantid, which is a little bit smaller. And then there is, of course, the Chinese mantid, which it was one that was brought into this country um, as a predator. And uh, a lot of the, um, they sold a lot of the egg cases to people for, um, as to, to keep and hatch and use as predators. So that made, made them um, pretty common now. Um, they are very large um, and they usually have brown with green and yellow stripes on their wings. They are generalist predators. Anything they can reach out and grab with those four legs, they will eat. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen these videos circulating around on Facebook and the internet of the praying mantis that caught the hummingbird. Um, if you did see that, it's not fake news. That is a true story. Um, they will, they do ambush their prey. They will sit very still waiting and waiting and when something gets close enough they will grab it and they will sit on a hummingbird feeder and grab a hummingbird. So if you do have a hummingbird feeder 
um, you may want to keep out, keep an eye out for these guys lurking around there. Um, Cause they'll eat, they, they actually, um, I read that they'll eat, they'll grab the hummingbird and they'll actually consume it over time, over several days and kill it. And you know, that makes me sad. So, um, so you, you know, you can decide whether or not you want to actually invite these guys into your garden. They don't really recommend buying um, the egg cases and bringing them in for these, for these reasons in that they will eat everything, including bees, including each other. Um, they're notorious for eating each other. Okay, um, I'm gonna get off of the, the bug insect uh, vein here a little bit and talk about some other things that you might see in your garden. Um, this is a leopard slug. Um, I actually started researching this after I found one in my garden and somebody told me, oh, those are good to have and you know, those will eat other slugs, which is true. Um, so these are actually a kind of a keeled slug. They have a, a small shell that's in, in the back, uh, only about a, a half to a quarter inch. And these slugs will grow from four to eight inches. Um, they were actually a native to Europe and they, you know, probably came here in some produce that was shipped at some time. Um, they are omnivores, so they will eat dead plants, fungi, um, they will eat other small slugs um, and snails. And for slugs, they're pretty fast. They will uh, pursue other slugs at a speed of six inches per minute. Um, so they will take care of the slugs that might be eating your um, strawberries or your other, your hostas. Um, so they are kind of a good thing, but they are omnivores, so they could also eat, eat things out of your garden. So it's up to you whether or not you want to have slugs, these slugs in your garden. Um, these guys are pretty long lived. They can live from three and a half to five years. Um, this is also something that people welcome into their garden. Um, this is a, an American toad. There's two kinds of toads that are common here. The other one is the fowler's toad. Um, I think the fowler's toad has a little bit wartier, otherwise they look the same, but it, it doesn't really matter because they are generally very beneficial. They will eat a large variety of insects and they will eat slugs. Um, you can encourage them to stay in your garden by providing a shelter for them to hide in. Um, you can actually turn a clay pot over and um, or tip over and find places where they can find shelter if you want to encourage them to your garden. Um, they are not dangerous. They don't cause, cause you to get warts if you pick them up. That's a, a, a myth. Um, if your animal, if your pets do bite them, they, they can uh, be irritated by the toxin because they will spray a little bit of a toxin if they're actually bitten like that. So you might want to keep your pets away from them. If you have pets that tend to chase toads, um, you might not want to invite toads to your garden. So that's, that's your choice. And this is one that I really love. So a lot of people are scared to death of these guys. Um, this is just your common garter snake. It is not venomous to people. Um, these guys can reach 52 inches in length. Um, they come in a wide range of colors and patterns. Um, they usually have a yellow or yellow green stripe running down their back. Um, they also have yellow stripes on their sides, as you can see in the picture, and most of them have the red spots. Um, they will eat toads, frogs, salamanders, insects, earthworms, bird eggs, mice, and other small mammals, and lizards, and even other snakes. Um, so if you want to have these in your garden, they won't stay around unless you have provide water and um, some kind of place for them to shelter. Uh, they don't like being out in the hot sun, so they'll be out in the, they are, they are daytime active, but they'll be out more in the cooler hours of the day. Um, they actually find their prey by smell and sight and they smell with their tongue. So this tongue, when they stick it out, they're using it to smell out their prey. Um, they're not dangerous to humans. They don't, they're afraid of you. They will run away from you. Um, and they do have a mild neurotoxin, but they use it on their prey and it doesn't harm humans. 
Uh, this is your box turtle. Um, I've had these come into my garden, so I wanted to include them. Um, these box turtles are, can reach about five to six inches on average. Um, they can live for up to 100 years. Um, these are the Eastern box turtles. They have um, brown, some have brown shells, some have olive green type brown shells, and they have yellow markings. Um, most Eastern box turtles have yellow markings on their feet and faces, as you can see here, but some of them don't have markings at all. Um, they are omnivores. So they will eat things out of your garden. They will eat your fruit, um, but they also eat insects, worms, slugs, and fung fungi. Um, so, and sometimes they even eat uh, scavenge for dead, off of dead animals. Um, so, and they will also eat berries, in insects, roots, flowers, eggs, amphibians, and the younger ones are more carnivorous than the, than the adults. Um, so when they're young, they'll feed in ponds, and when they get older, they'll feed on land. And sometimes you might find a box turtle, a lot of them have been taken out of their habitats, which is not good for them because they don't tend to adapt well to a change in habitat. So if you find one, unless it's in the middle of the road and you think it's going to get run over, um, it's best to, to let it be in its, in its native area. They don't, don't survive well. Um, and last but not least, and not generally thought of as a monster um, in your garden, so it's kind of a misfit here. Um, if you have berries, a lot of berries, you may think of birds as a monster eating your berries, but they're also very good to have around your garden because they eat a lot of insects. This is a bluebird pictured, obviously. You can see he has a grasshopper in his mouth. Uh, they do eat grasshoppers, crickets, beetles, uh, larva and moths. Um, wrens and warblers and towhees will eat aphids, spiders, mosquitoes, and caterpillars. Um, cardinals will eat beetles, grasshoppers, leafhoppers, stink bugs, and snails. Starlings, I don't know if I have many starlings around here, but starlings will eat Japanese beetles. They're one of the few um, birds that actually consume Japanese beetles. Um, and robins and cardinals will eat the Japanese beetle grubs that are in your yard. So if you see them poking around in your yard, they're probably looking for grubs. Um, the thing about Japanese beetles is you can tell by their name that they are not native. And the problem with Japanese beetles and why they're so prolific is because they don't have a lot of natural enemies here. Um, but the starlings, if you see starlings, they were one of the few things that will eat them. And then you have, as we mentioned earlier, the parasitoids, um, the, the flies and the wasp that will eat those. And I just wanted to, I'm not going to go through these, but I just wanted to show you this for an impact that there are so many more that we didn't talk about here. Um, lots and lots and lots of predatory and parasitoid insects that are out there. So that's just a part of a list that I got out of my uh, resources. Um, briefly, I want to tell you, we've mentioned this a few times, if you want to attract these beneficials to your garden, um, a lot of them as um, adults eat pollen and nectar. So if you plant a large variety of flowering herbs and, fl and flowers, um, you attract those adults and then the adults will lay eggs there and their larvae will be the predators of the, of the other bugs. Um, like any other living th thing, everything needs water. So I have a, um, a butterfly puddler in my garden for the insects. Um, and some kind of shelter, even if the shelter can be um, a, an overgrown area of flowers or herbs where they can hide away from predators. Um, I was so excited because I have a, uh, um, a swallowtail larva pupated in my, um, in my yard the other day and I'm watching it and it's, um, it's pretty well hidden because I lost all of my other swallowtail larvae. I'd see them and then they'd be gone and I think they got eaten by birds or, or something. So, you know, it's all a balance of nature. Um, just a word about pesticides. Um, in order to encourage these good bugs, you want to 
avoid using pesticides because you will kill, you want to kill the bad bugs, you'll kill the good bugs and everything else along with it. So we like to discourage the use of just um, general pesticides that kill everything. Um, so you should first try, we talked here, as you can see in red, about biological control, which is where bugs, the bugs will eat the other bugs. That's biological control. Um, another, other ways you can try, what I do with Japanese beetles is mechanical control. I actually go out there, I usually put on a glove because I don't like their little feet touching me, but I pick them off of the plants and toss them into a bucket of soapy water. Um, so that's mechanical control. Um, cultural control is where you do practice things like crop rotation. Um, if you have an infestation of, I had problems with um, squash bugs, then the next, they will overwinter there. You plant your squash somewhere else the next year and try to avoid them. So that's a cultural control. Um, if you do need to use a pesticide, um, we, I recommend using an insecticidal soap, um, which is pretty harmless to the environment. Um, and also the neem oil, which is also great as a fungicide. Um, the neem oil you put on the plants that, that are being eaten, and when the insect eats that plant, it ingests the neem oil, and that's how it dies. So it's great because it doesn't kill by contact, it kills by, by being ingested. And I have, a, a, I have so many resources that I use for this presentation. It's crazy, books, um, a lot of websites. I have these all in a document that I will be emailing um, out to you later. Um, and that is the end of that. We are an equal opportunity provider to everyone. Um, and now we are coming up on our question time. If you have questions that don't get answered today, um, or you want to even send us a picture of a bug for identification, um, you can email us at our Kent County Master Gardeners Gmail address here, um, and we will do our best to try to figure out um, what kind of bug this is and tell you if it's something you want to keep or maybe not. Um, we are going to, uh, I need to give you the online evaluation link. I'll put that in the chat box when I close this and also um, I want to encourage you to check out our website at um, the Delaware State University's um, website, our page, which is listed here. Um, we have, an order, in, in addition to our workshop list, we have uh, some of the recordings from our previous workshops if you'd like to watch those. Um, so at this time, uh, if we have any questions, Verna, does, are there any questions for me? Uh, there are a couple, and some of them you did address, but maybe um, you, if you wanted to comment. Um, there's one question about, do aphid eggs resemble lady be beetle eggs? Aphid eggs? Um, lady, be lady beetle, I'm not sure what aphid eggs look like. I assume they're probably really, really tiny, but the lady beetle eggs are very unique because they're kind of a, a, of a shape. They kind of had a pointed end, and they'll be laid in a cluster and they're kind of an orangish yellow. So that's why they're easy to recognize. And they'll be planted, they may be, be laid right near the live aphids so that when the, um, when the larva hatch, their food is right there. Um, so you don't have to worry about what the aphid eggs look like because the, the, if you have the lady beetle eggs, they will eat those when they hatch. Um, there is a question, and I, you did mention, you know, picking uh, Japanese beetles off of plants, you know, uh, but there's how to get, how do we get rid of Japanese beetles? Yeah, I wish I knew. Um, we have tried um, milky spore, putting that in the soil. It, it takes a long time for it to act. I don't like using chemicals, and this is kind of a, of a thing that they ingest when they eat, when the grubs are in the soil. Um, Getting rid of them, like I said, they are basically an invasive species, so they don't have a lot of natural enemies. Um, luckily, they're around for just a short time. I think mine are starting to disappear already, um, but they were, they were eating my elderberries and they were eating my um, crepe myrtle. Um, the best way I would do, we would go out there in the morning, hand pick them or knock them off, put them in insecticidal soap. And then when we got the, all the, the ones off, we would spray neem oil to keep the um, rest of them from biting the, the plants or making them die when they bite the plants. Um, other than that, 
just, just, you just have to be vigilant and kind of do this every day. Um, there are some pretty harsh chemicals you can use. Um, I don't like using those because you'll kill the bees, you'll kill the, um, the dragonflies, all the good bugs that are out there if you spray with something like seven or something like that. But seven will kill them. I mean, they, it will kill them as a last resort. Um, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say about that. Any, any more? Yes, um, there's someone who commented that they're seeing lots of black ground beetles dead behind their barn. Um, and they've never seen this happen before. Any ideas? And the person commented, I don't spray pesticides. And this is the only place I see these dead beetles. Um, there's a lot of beetles that are black and round. So I would recommend that you send us a picture so we can um, make a, a better um, identification of that one. Um, so many beetles are black um, and I, ca I can't say what could have killed them. Um, sometimes, you know, bugs like anything else will get diseases and viruses. And I, I don't know if they're a good bug or a bad bug without actually seeing a nice picture of them. So um, I would encourage you to send a picture to Kent County Master Gardeners at gmail.com. Um, and uh, we will try to figure out what that is and why what's happening to it. There's another question. Um, can larva of the beneficial insects be purchased and where? Um, I don't know where you, where to purchase them. You would have to look that up yourself. I couldn't recommend any particular um, retailer. I think a lot of times they're sold to like, you know, um, businesses, greenhouses, places that are, are um, raising things. I know that you can buy live lady beetles. Um, there's actually, I think it was in Colorado I read, there's a place where the lady beetles go to hibernate because they'll hibernate in the winter. Um, and they actually go in there and scoop up a whole bunch of hibernating lady beetles, bag them up and sell them on the internet. Um, you know, this can be good. This can be not so good because they're taken out of their environment. So if you're here and somebody in Colorado um, gathered up a bunch of ladybugs, they may not be the ladybugs that are native to this area. So you might have the possibility of bringing something in that's not appropriate for Delaware. Um, so uh, that's one of the cautions I would make to, to buying things online. As far as buying larva, I think generally what's sold is probably eggs instead of the larva. So um, like I say, if you wanted to purchase um, rove beetles, you would go buy um, eggs and then you would put them where you wanted them and then the larva would hatch and do what you wanted them to do. Okay, there was a comment about man, uh, praying mantises also eat a lot of pollinators. Yes, they do. They eat it, they're generalists. They eat anything. Anything they can grab with those little forelegs um, and they, they ambush. So they could sit on a flower waiting for a bee and when that bee comes up, they grab it and they will eat, they will eat anything. Like I said, even hummingbirds. So, um, you know, you may or may not want to encourage them. I mean, what I usually do if I find a, a I don't kill, I don't kill too many bugs at all. I kill Japanese beetles, um, mosquitoes, flies, house flies, and I don't kill spiders. Um, I don't generally kill bugs in my garden. Um, but uh, if I find a praying mantis and it's not where I want it to be, you can actually, you know, just kind of take a little card and put it into a little jar and move it somewhere else. Um, where it might be able to do more good, like especially if it's near your hummingbird feeder. You can, uh, instead of killing it, you can take it and put it somewhere else. They don't move very fast, so not very likely that they will come right back. Okay, um, do garter snakes nest in holes in the ground? Garter snakes like to nest in piles of debris. Um, that's why they recommend not keeping um, piles of, of twigs or old wood or something up next to your house um, because it's possible they could get into your into your house or your basement um, but they like to I don't think they nest underground I wouldn't I wouldn't quote on it, but in general they like to nest in in a shelter at like a um, you know a pile of old sticks those those type of areas um, and someone just commented that they have the same problem um, with um, Japanese beetles and brown stink bugs 
Yeah, the 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 brown stink bugs. I I squish them. I mean, I use I use the manual control if I see one. You know, and and they come in my house too. Um, and and you know, they they die. I don't. I kill stink bugs unless I think they're a good stink bug, which you know. I've learned a lot in my research, actually, and I probably would think twice now. If it's in my house, yeah, it's gone. But if it's in my garden, I'm gonna I'm gonna observe it a little bit closer and make a decision if it could be one of the uh, the uh, spine soldier bugs or the two spotted. Um, then I would probably just let it go on its way. And I think that's about it. All right. Um, well, again, I'm going to, I'm going to get out of my presentation here and I am going to, um, drop the, oh, I had a question. I was just trying to type into the chat. Okay. Um, uh, I had, a a garter snake in our compost pile. Okay. Probably means it's eating my earthworms. Um, it could be, um, so I don't I, think I would want a, a garter snake in my compost pile. Is your compost pile away from your house? Yes. Okay, well, that's good. Um, because you don't want to, you know, it's, it's, it might be eating the worms. I can't really say. I don't, it, but it's possible it could be. Um, I don't know how you, would get, how you would get it out of there. If you could try to lure it out with something. Um, I, the, the, the garter snakes I've had here kind of just slither through my yard and move on their way and I'm not sure where they go. Um, so you said, I, that, you said that they eat earthworms and I figured that's mm -hmm. why it's in my compost and I, how do you get rid of a garter snake? So. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how you would get rid of it without, you know, you can try to capture it um, and move it. I wouldn't kill it. You might want to try to relocate it if you can capture it in some kind of a, of a um, you know, they make these containers that you can put, uh, catch snakes in actually. That I, people used to do that all the time when I was a kid, catch snakes and play with them and let them loose somewhere. Um, but I, I'm not really sure how you would go about it other than trying to, to capture it in some way and then re relocate it somewhere else um maybe where you have something that you actually want it to eat like what like what you would want it to eat um, right. um i don't if you have a problem with they eat they eat animals if you have a problem with voles you might want it to go near voles or any any of the uh problem insects that it might eat so anything that's causing you a problem, if not, you might want to just, if you relocate it, maybe you could relocate it um, off your property. It's not like a turtle. You can, you can move it somewhere um, without it suffering too much. Uh, at, without it coming right back, I suppose. Yeah, you'd probably have to take it like not you know, not just to the other side of your yard, it would probably go right back. But if you took it like across the street or, you know, to a wood somewhere, wooded area, maybe it would um, go around doing its thing in, in the natural world. Okay. I'm trying to find the evaluation link and I'm having a little bit of trouble finding that. So uh, Judy also mentioned that it could be using the warmth from the outer layer of your compost pile. Um, but you know, you can relocate snakes and, and that's a, probably yeah. the most humane thing to do because, you know, garter snakes are very beneficial. Um, you know, you could also, if you have any tall grass around your yard or any piles of anything, um, you know, make sure you, you, if you keep your yard, you know, a little more tidy, sometimes the snakes tend to not want to hang around. Like, I don't know if near your compost pile, maybe there's tall grasses or anything like that. Yeah. And snakes are, snakes are cold blooded. So, um, they, you know, they, they like to keep their temperature, their body temperature, you know, under control. So it's possible that they may be attracted to your compost pile more in the winter time just to try to keep warm. Um, but they'll be just, they'll just go out in the, in the lawn and sun themselves in the mornings or the evenings, you know, and then go hide uh, under something in the shade in the uh, hottest part of the day. Oh, 
Okay. I just don't want them eating my earthworms. Yeah. Well, you, you can try to re you can try to relocate them. Other than that, you know, I mean, have you seen him eating earthworms or are you just assuming that he No, I just, no, I, I, I haven't. I've just heard you say that. They yeah. Like I don't earthworms. think there's any earthworm shortage. So probably, um, he wouldn't eat, be able to eat all of them and he might be eating, you know, you may have some other critters out there that he's taking care of for you. Um, you know, compost pile with food in it can attract some undesirable things like um, rats and mice. So it could be that he's taking care of rats and mice for you. Um, hopefully not rats, but there might be mice. I mean, there are field mice that run around and might want to peruse your compost for some snacks. And the, the uh, could be that the snake is waiting there to catch those mice. Oh, there is another question that I forgot to ask. Okay. Um, is there anything that eats asparagus beetles? Um, well, your generalist predators will eat everything. You know, your praying mantises um, and your ground beetles even will eat everything. Um, so, you know, the I don't know that there's any specific predator of asparagus beetles that I that I came across in my research. But your generalist, those ones like the um, like the praying mantis, the rob, well, the, they're not aerial, so they're not likely to get eaten by uh, dragonflies because the dragonflies eat things that are flying. Although last year we had a uh, problem with bagworms and my husband was standing out there and he actually saw a bagworm grab, a, a dragonfly grab a bagworm out of our tree. So I was like, whoa, that's amazing. So you never know. Oh, and there was a comment um, that snakes um, do not go into the soil after earthworms. They only eat the ones that come out from On the, the surface, right. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Debbie. You did great. Thank you. Great, Debbie. Great. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you.